and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm David Breer, Group CEO here at 11FS. In this episode, we're going to be taking a closer look at open banking. There has been lots happening in this space globally, especially over the last couple of years. So we're going to give you guys a bit of a 101 for everything that you need to know and potentially some stuff you don't need to know as well, but let's uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, I mean, open banking allows financial institutions across the world to share data and more globalized connected banking system is a good thing, both for the customers and the, the organizations that it, it aims to serve as well. It enables customers to share personal financial information securely, which can broaden the products and those services available to help them. For example, personal finance apps help individuals to manage their finances, track spending, habits, save and access financial services all from one place. Lenders can better evaluate the borrowing power of applicants if they can access credit history from other financial services providers as well. And have you ever sent a payment to somebody without needing to manually input bank details? Likelihood is that's powered by open banking in some form or another. So today, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the countries with an established open banking framework, those in the process of creating the regulation for it, and those who are slipping a little bit behind. It's a really... Uh, good chance for us to try and understand the current state of open banking around the world today. And to have this discussion with us today, I'm joined by some super duper awesome guests. Firstly, we're delighted to welcome Kian Pillay, who is the CEO and co-founder at Stitch over in South Africa. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you for having me. Very good. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know and, and all the listeners that we've got around the world, tell us a little bit more about Stitch. Sure. Stitch is a um, fintech business. We help enterprises both in Africa as well as enterprises entering Africa for the first time move money. Um, and what does that mean? That basically means three things. One is we help those businesses accept money. So that's collecting money in all the weird shapes and forms that you can in Africa. Uh, two, that is managing your money. So helping enterprises with recon, setting up bank accounts, movement uh, kind of across that. And third is payouts. All right. How do they move that money once they've received it, whether it's locally or it's like back to their international markets where they operate primarily. Fantastic. Uh, very well versed in open banking then. So uh, great to have you on the show and uh, look forward to talking to you more about it. Uh, it is also a big FinTech Insider hello to Andrew Escobar, who is the former director of open finance at MX in Canada. Welcome to the show, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, David. No problem at all. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, do you want to give a little bit of uh, color to your background? Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I'm the former director of open finance or open banking at MX, a leading open finance uh, platform and player in the fintech ecosystem. Uh, I'm taking a bit of sabbatical uh, at this time to sort of take advantage of all the interesting developments that are happening uh, in the open banking space uh, and looking to return my focus to Canada as a number of US uh, and Canadian fintechs really start to pay more attention to open banking and, and what it can offer consumers. Very cool. The Canadian market is uh, changing uh, by the day, isn't it? Uh, both in terms of uh, the regulatory side and the what's actually happening in the market from a competitive perspective. So it's uh, great to have you over on the show as, as well. Uh, let's dive in then, because I think there's lots of uh, things for us to kind of cover in this. Uh, and if, maybe if we start by looking a little bit at the use cases for open banking, I know there's always a, a lot of talk about, or oh, do customers understand it? But fundamentally, it's always about really what it does, the problems it solves for people. So uh, Kian, if I uh, sort of start with you. I mean, I, we mentioned payments as a as a use case for open banking uh, right at the top of the show. I mean, how much of an impact has this really had in this space, do you think, so far? For us, pretty massive. Um, I think, like, I'll just speak for our markets and, and sort of our experience, but we started as a quote-unquote open banking data player, right? The equivalent of AISP, where we would collect uh, information for lenders and all sorts of likes. I would say that largely was a convenience thing and was not a necessity thing in our market and when we started, and that was, you know, three-ish years ago. We um, had fairly abysmal traction to start there and we didn't get too much off the ground. Um, we sort of had like little nibbles and had some good pull for us to move into payments. Uh, and that immediately became clear that that was a necessity it was just completely underserved market right um for like a little bit of color 
African markets in general are very low card penetrated. Um, South Africa is a fascinating market because we're actually exceptionally bank penetrated. We're 80% bank penetrated. It looks a lot like the States. Um, current estimates are that like 50% of those bank accounts can use a card online, right? Whether it's they physically just don't have a piece of plastic or you don't have a quote unquote internet enabled card. Um, I don't know if you guys remember. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when you were starting to use cards online for the first time, there were like some cards that just didn't work online, right? Um, and that is like largely the case for, for many, many people still in uh, South Africa, at least. And if you combine those two things, right, you combine like people having bank accounts, but people having very low utility, typically the way people operated in South Africa was like for the mass market and kind of like a lower income uh, market is payday would come everybody would receive their salary into a bank account because that's what your employer requires you to do. And then there would be two, three hour lines outside of ATMs, uh, right? Because people would draw the whole thing in cash. And so it was like this bizarre thing where you do have this great like banking ecosystem, but no one would take advantage of it. And suddenly if you could kind of give them a way to say like, hey, you can transact online. It doesn't have to be a card. You can kind of use like, you know, w what you know and what you have. You don't need to take your money out. We saw massive, massive, massive adoption. Um, and so we kind of did it in, in like two ways, I would say, and how 2023 played out was very interesting. We started and we did the like over the top way, right? Screen scraping, reverse engineering, which is kind of, you know, similar how Plaid and Tink kind of started and got traction there. And that worked well. Um, and we currently still have no like government mandated open banking frameworks, but the banks themselves are moving pretty quickly. We had the largest bank in South Africa, Capitec, um, which is also the newest of kind of the big banks in South Africa launched Capitec Pay this year, which was the equivalent of an open banking payments platform and that has just massively taken off. Um, it launched in April. Um, it probably does about half the volume that all of the UK does, maybe even a little bit more than that in nine months. And it's been like really phenomenal to see like them capture a, a very nascent market. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? As you say, the, the the maturity of every market means that these things grow in slightly different ways. You know, arguably what the competitor there was is, wasn't another person doing the same thing in the market. It was standing in a queue for two hours to withdraw money, you know? And, yeah. and actually that's where we're talking about convenience. That is a, you know, if you can save people money or you can save people time, ideally both, then uh, you're probably onto something, aren't you? Which, uh, uh, but you, you say the, the uptake to start with wasn't great. I mean, obviously that turned around. Around, right? The uptake on data wasn't great. And we still actually don't see, we, we tangentially see people use the open banking data products uh, to like accompany payments products. Uh, we see like a lot of usage for any volatized type player, use it to get someone's identity when they're making a transaction, right? To prevent fraud. Um, we actually see very little adoption on like straight up open banking data. Um, largely, and it's, it's kind of like a ridiculous thing to say, but manual labor in a lot of these markets is just very cheap, uh, right? So the, the equivalent actually for many businesses and enterprises making this decision to fully automate and go fully digital, um, is like, do I stop sending PDFs to very, very cheap manual labor, which I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years? It's not, you know, super costly. It works. It's fast. Um, like, that was the sort of trade-off we were making there. And it was minimal. Uh, like a lot of enterprises just said, listen, we get it. We understand that this data thing and what you're doing, automation is great. It makes sense. We're going to do it in five years. All right. The payments thing was like, oh no, we need this now. We can just like grow the pie 3x, 5x, 10x if we have this. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's, uh, as you say, it's uh, sort of seeing down the road a little bit in terms of those those opportunities, but solve a real problem for today, I, I, I guess. I, I mean, Andrew, we're, we're seeing a lot of things happening around open banking in, in Canada. You know, we touched on this a little bit at the beginning. You know, there's lots of different players actually springing up uh, in similar ways that they have done in, in other geos. But, um, you know, we touched on Plaid a second ago. There's different players in the, the Canadian market. There's different players in the US market. Um, I mean, how have you seen this change? You know, the, the regulatory side of things change, the competitive side of things change. It's, uh, it's a, a great market to focus on. Yeah, it, it is a great market and uh, a dynamic one. Open banking, of course, is, is rolling out a bit slower um, than other jurisdictions, but it's not to say that open banking isn't already uh, in the North American market in both uh, Canada and the U.S., and regulation, of course, is a, a part of it, but it it's different in, in each market. 
I think what's really interesting in the, in the US market is open banking very much started or was aided by legislation over a decade ago, right? In, in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act, to get really technical, enabled open banking and created a consumer data right in a very meaningful way, but without regulation and rules, it's been a bit of the wild west in the US around open banking and the sharing of financial data. Whereas in Canada, we haven't had that legislation, we haven't had that regulation. It's been very slow, a very slow process, but we're at this really interesting point uh, in the Canadian market where regulation and legislation, both hand in hand, are being considered. And it looks like 2025 might be the year uh, open banking is both legislated and properly regulated. But that also means that there's been a huge development in the last year or so towards that point. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing one, isn't it? That um, I think none of us, when we were sort of uh, you know growing up, and uh, we were like, yeah, yeah, financial services. None of us were like regulation. That's going to be the really sexy part of the industry. That's the bit. But actually, like to to your point, whether it's Dodd Frank or whether it's the uh, Payment Services Directive over in uh, Europe, actually, these are the things that have sort of been the first domino to start these movements going. I, I guess to that point, Andrew, we've seen iteration around those things. Obviously, uh, most recently we've seen, uh, I think it was last uh, last July, August time, we saw uh, PSD3 uh, coming to, to Europe and we've seen the advancements in open banking in the UK uh, and obviously the, the iterations that we're seeing within the US market as well. I, I mean, it, it does feel like the, the regulation has to be a, a foundational point of, of open banking. Um, why do you think that is? Is it because... I mean, it, it, what's in it? I always sort of said there's not a lot of carrot for the big organizations in this. You know, the idea that you open up all of your data for third parties to get access to, that doesn't sound like a good thing if you're always talking about owning the customer and owning the, you know, those end-to-end -end journeys. But actually, it feels like uh, it feels like the regulation has pushed that to, to happen. In some cases, regulation is going to be foundational. In, in, other, in some other markets, regulation maybe isn't a necessity. If you look at the US market, is regulation needed? Um, yes, but absent regulation, there's been an immense amount of development around open banking and connectivity to banks in the last, let's say five years, where some of the largest banks are willing to stand up API connectivity to their banks and allow their customers to share their data in a secure and consumer provisioned way. Um, that goes beyond what we typically rely on in financial services and fintech screen scraping. So if, if you look at the development in the US market, I think it's interesting to note that without regulation, they've managed to achieve a lot uh, in the industry and moving to API connectivity and away from screen scraping. I think what regulation allows you to do though is clarify those rules so that the holdouts, some, some of the other largest banks are brought to the table and you provide regulatory certainty to mid-tier and small community banks who absent rules and regulation might not see a need to do this or might be weary of making what for them is a considerable investment in open banking or connectivity. Yeah. And, and standardization to a certain degree as well. I mean, we were all, uh, we're all talking to each other. You're in Canada. You're in South Africa. I'm in in the UK. We use you'll use electricity, but our plugs are quite different, aren't they? You know, and actually getting consistency on what those things are and how they work is is really critical. I, I guess before we take a quick break, because there's so much more to kind of unpack on this one in terms of kind of where we're going. There's a, a an, an interesting uh, conversation that sort of came from the the community on this one in terms of a, a question uh, from Lewis Sutton, who reached out via X. Um, obviously, you know, open banking across the world really is about opening up and giving more ownership of customers' data to them, the, allowing them to do more interesting things with, whether it's with the organization that it resides with or whether it's with another, uh, another party. Um, what other verticals do you think this has applicability to? There was a, you know, energy 
areas, telecoms, pensions, wealth insurance. So, I mean, Kian, what, what do you think? Do you think there is a uh, a benefit for those other industries to, for a, an open banking style uh, opening up of their data as well? Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little bit biased. I used to. I used to work at a digital bank that was meant to, was a startup was meant to be a bank account for developers we had all sorts of difficulties with that from our banking partner perspective and we sort of pivoted all of our tech into the insurance space um and slow and difficult because insurance is just like big big business and big corporate uh, but like fascinating fascinating uh ways to apply it to individual consumers uh unfortunately not a ton of what we did saw the light of day but we bought some like really interesting stuff where consumers could like volunteer to share certain pieces of information and they could get rewarded for that they could get better premiums and better rates uh, for these sort of things they could be underwritten in in more favorable ways to them um and it was all completely consumer consent um and it was like it was just fascinating how quickly you could turn consumer data into meaningful outcomes, whether it's better premiums or it's just like better gamification, better utilization of insurance products and understanding. Um, so for me, I'm still like itching to see like where the overlap between open banking um, and uh, like the insurance side of things comes into play. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a ton of different industries. Insurance is, is personally one I have a soft spot for. Um, which is also not not very sexy, um, but yeah, I, I think very interesting. Hey, I started in insurance before banking. I can uh, attest that it's not a sexy industry. But uh, uh, Andrew, what, what do you think? Uh, is this sort of opening up of data applicable to other industries as well? It, it absolutely is, and I think that you need to think of it in the Australian context, where they're not limiting um, a right to data to only financial data, but all sorts of data. So it's not just open banking, it's not just open finance, but open data writ large, which will include uh, energy, telecom, and other sets of data that are valuable to individuals. But for me, the one that I think about most that I don't think is included when uh, we're talking about open banking and open finance is payroll data. I think payroll data is at the heart of everyone, most individuals' financial lives. Um, Certainly in the Canadian US market, most receive a salary, most are on a, a biweekly payroll. And if you can start there and provide open access to payroll data, I think that would strengthen the financial health of, of many individuals and allow them to be better informed of when are they getting paid, how much are they getting paid, and have that be the source of their um, financial lives as opposed to um, a deposit current uh, checking account it, it would it would many ways allow consumers to redefine how they organize their financial lives and start with their payroll there's such an interesting use case around um, early access to wages uh, and i think that it's it's not fully developed and we really need need to think about some of our most underserved uh, consumers are those who are reliant on that paycheck uh, week to week. Um, and if you can figure out how to get access to payroll data, I think you can make a really big impact in the lives of, of many individuals. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, some of the Nordic countries have definitely looked at, you know, automating things like taxes or the, uh, you, you're going to put a lot of uh, uh, accountants out of uh, of business uh, filling out bits of paper uh, at different times of the year, aren't you, in that one? But I, I think it's a really interesting question, though, Louis. I, I think um, energy and telco, you know, is kind of a commoditized market. So really, the uses for that at that point is, is switching, really. Um, insurance, similar, it's quite a commoditized market. So it becomes a switch switching thing. Like I think the the challenge for those markets particularly is is about the fundamentals of the business model. I think when you look at energy and telco, I mean insurance is predicated on hoping people renew and don't shop around, you know, like that's not a so actually anything that starts to make people uh, more aware of actually their opportunities and movement in that, whether that's an insurance premium for your car or whether it's uh, the teaser rate on your credit card has expired or that savings rate has dropped down to nothing, you know, anything in that instance is 
is a great thing for the consumer, but it's going to be interesting to see who could potentially provide those services because it's not actually in the interest of the the product provider themselves to to do those things. I, I really think, I mean, obviously we're seeing things like the pensions dashboard over in the UK, um, eventually getting to us from a regulatory perspective. Um, but I'd say the wealth space. Uh, I, I think if we had a really fully integrated uh, wealth experience, to your point, you know, Andrew, all of the things that actually make you you in terms of however large or small amount that that is being maximized for you, um, that is a really exciting opportunity. But I think that directionally for me takes us and takes financial services to a really, really different place. I think it's it's almost at the point where we've got service providers and we've got manufacturers of financial products. And and it might be a very different world that we live in to get there, but um, but I'd be uh, I'd very much would prefer a world where the person I entrust to, to hold my balances are, are there to make them worth more rather than not, if that makes sense. You made an interesting point that I think when many think of open data, they think of switching and what it will do to churn or customers leaving the provider, whether it's in telecom, energy, wealth, and financial services. And that's a natural reaction. What open data allows you to do though is create stickiness in any of these industries we just discussed. Think of an energy provider. Yes, open data in the energy sector might cause you to shop around uh, more if you're able to do that in your jurisdiction. But if your energy provider is able to provide you real-time usage on, on what you're paying, when you're using it the most, and make it um, lively, so you can get an instant notification on your, on your phone. Hey, you're using a lot of energy. What's going on? Well, we running the laundry at 5 p.m. We probably shouldn't do that. That's the kind of, of stickiness that, um, yes, can drive costs down for you as an individual and potentially uh, for the energy provider. But generally speaking, it means that you can disperse energy uses um, and uh, lower those those peak rates, uh, smooth out uh, energy costs, and everyone wins. And I think that is also true within financial services as well. You can't simply see it as um, a challenge. You need to see it as an opportunity to create value for you, for the consumer. Everyone can win. Quick, quick anecdote. I, I think it's a really in interesting point. I think where it gets hard is not everyone wants to create those experiences, right? Um, corporates sometimes have sat on a lot of data and that's been their, their value add. And it's hard to innovate and it's hard to actually provide a, a genuinely engaging experience. Um, there was like a, a really interesting um, court case in South Africa a few years ago where two insurers um, went to court where there was like a very long, convoluted, multi-year process in which you got like a status with one of your insurers, right? And if you did these 400 things over three years, you could be a gold member, right? Um, and it was all quite uh, uh, centralized and it was all within that one uh, insurer. And as a consumer, you didn't really have much engagement with it, but it like meaningfully impacted your rates. And another South African insurer said, Hey, like send us all of your data, like send us PDFs and screenshots of your dashboard and stuff like that. And we will give you like a better rate. If you're gold on, you know, insurer A, we'll, we'll give you the better rate. We'll give you the equivalent of a gold rate with us. And insurer A obviously said, whoa, what the hell are you doing? Right. That's our data. We built up this data over four years. No way you can come like take it and score our users. Um, and they went to court and it was like, you know, a four year battle or whatever it was. And eventually they lost. Um, and they said, no, this is the consumer's data. They're free to share it with whoever they want. Um, and I think like, you know, insurer A, who ended up losing the right to the data actually came out a lot worse in the end because they couldn't innovate fast enough to do anything meaningful from an engagement perspective. And that's tough. Um, that's hard for corporates to do it. I think you're totally right. I think if they did just turn it around and they made it uh, like more engaging and actually built something interesting for their users, they would have kept them. Um, but it proves like a huge opportunity for people that are willing to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? We often joke, uh, people forgot that uh, there was uh, services in financial services, but uh, it's one of those ones that uh, if you lead with all of those things, you know, and you were always trying to serve the customer and provide them with better experiences, that's ultimately where you create that stickiness, as you say, Andrew. So it's a, it's a great point. All right, we're going to have to take a, a quick break. Uh, coming up, we're going to take a little bit of a look about the future of open banking, speak a little bit more to Kian about how Stitch is championing open banking solutions in South Africa. And importantly, we're going to decide if 
Online Pepper Man King is even working at this stage? And what do we need to do to ensure that its long-term success is a certain thing? We'll be back after a quick interlude. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Insights. Uh, we now understand what open banking is and how it's being used, and we've taken a closer look at the next steps that are going to be taken to implement open banking frameworks in North America. Now, let's take a bit of a closer look at the parts of the world where open banking is really only just getting started, and in some cases, doesn't really happen at all. So, I, I mean, Kian, tell us a little bit more then about, about Stitch. I mean, why do you think South Africa needs open banking? What is it about the region that you think is really prime for it? Sure. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I think the dynamic is, for whatever reason, is is just fascinating. We're so such a banked population, um, but fifty percent plus of all transactions in South Africa are still cash, um, right? So very banked. Still, unfortunately, like a very lower income population, um, and so the combination I think of these things is like there's just a fascinating op opportunity for this. Anyone that can engage with the mass market in a digital fashion is will be the first player to be able to do this and just incorporate you know the majority of the market which you know you you, you say they're financially intuitive because they have a bank account but actually they do zero digitally online with their financial life um, and so I think that's been a really fascinating kind of dynamic to sort of watch play out in the last couple of years I you know would say that it has been pretty slow, or well, not slow. It's you know anything that comes from direct government regulation or mandates just takes time, um, and it's difficult to see all of them. This is the case in emerging markets. This is the case in Western markets. Um, it can just be slow from that perspective. What we have seen is you know some of the banks directly pioneering their own APIs and actually themselves coming forward with all of this. I mentioned Capitec previously, which now is the largest bank in South Africa and primarily serves a lower income population. They've What they've been able to do is for the first time ever, just give people access to be able to live and spend financially online, um, right? Uh, it's at no cost to the consumer. It opens it up uh, in a way that's never been opened up before. And it allows people to genuinely displace cash, um, which I think it's hard to kind of talk about open banking without in some way, shape or form mentioning real-time payments, uh, right? I think like UPI in India and PIX in Brazil have also like done this in a very interesting way. Like I think the open banking and like bank payment APIs is fascinating to be able to pay merchants. Um, I think that in combination with like real-time payments at a cost level that is effective for a mass market is a genuine cash displacement tool, which is like a, a real, I, I think everybody talks about Africa and they say, we're like leapfrog banks. Um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily think that's true. I don't think it's all going to go to fintechs and banks won't exist. I've always been you know, a, a big believer that banks will play a massive part in this. But how much do the card networks have to play in this or other incumbent methods? I'm not sure. Um, and I, I, I think it's like fascinating to see like all of these things, open banking, real-time payments rails come into play um, and, and watch it unfold in these markets. Yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody's always trying to make the pie bigger, but everybody's always trying to get a bigger slice for themselves to a certain degree, aren't they? So there's uh, different players in that, whether it's bubble network operators or the payment providers or the banks themselves. It's uh, there's always everybody's always looking for opportunities in that way. But uh, I, I mean, uh, South Africa. I mean, it's interesting. You, you say you know, fifty percent of uh, a lot, you know, a lot higher percentage you've got access to cars, but only fifty percent are registered online. I mean, it's like fifty percent of the population is using social media. We've got nearly two mobile phones in. That hands of every person which is crazy you know so it connectivity isn't an issue there um i mean is it still considered an emerging market in that sense it, because of the sophistication in the the uh the financial services system or, or do you think it's moved beyond that now um pieces have moved beyond that um so i would say access to the internet, I would say access to smartphones, um, you know, all of those have massively increased in the last few years. Um, certain basic infrastructure um, in terms of trade, in terms of like housing and transport, 
very emerging still uh, for like the mass population. I, I think largely uh, it's it's easy to like look at certain cities and they look very cosmopolitan and very international and uh, they certainly don't look like emerging uh, markets like a Cape Town or a Johannesburg. But the reality is like the large mass population of South Africa uh, still really uh, lives uh, in very basic conditions, very lower income. Uh, and so there's certain pieces that I, I think it's alluring to say, ac actually, we are not an emerging market. I think you can cherry pick a bunch of statistics. 80% of people are banks and so financial inclusion is great. But uh, like if you just double click or you just, you know, on the 25th of every month, go and look at what ATMs look like. I think it's very easy to see that that's not true. Um, I think we do have incredibly robust financial infrastructure. Um, I, I've always been fascinating spending time throughout the continent, spending a lot of time in the States, spending a lot of time in Europe. South Africa actually has like fascinating financial infrastructure and uh, even other African markets. Like Nigeria has a, has had a real-time payments rail for over five years. Um, that's like phenomenal. Every transaction comes with someone's identity. It's real time. Um, so a lot of that is true, but like how mass market it is in terms of access, not always there. Yeah. I mean, Andrew, how much do you think that's critical? Because, I mean, obviously you, you touched on this with the, I mean, look, mint.com in the US, like, you know, everybody could get a pie chart. It was great. You know, like actually the, uh, here's all your data, here's a thing. But that connectivity to real-time payments and doing something, that that feels like it's a critical part. I mean, I, I guess it's why when you look at open banking in the UK, you know, real-time payments are great. Variable reoccurring payments going forward are going to be great for, uh, you know, really connecting that to doing something as well, right? I think payments are always going to be an integral part of open banking because payments are integral to financial services and our financial lives but its impact plays out differently in different markets because of the uh, differences in our payment capabilities and they impact our markets in different ways. I'll use maybe just the US and Canada as a quick example. I think one of my working theories as to why open banking is has rolled out more slowly in Canada, both um, by the market and by regulators uh, is because we've had, I think, an early and robust payments infrastructure well ahead of the US. Um, card adoption, tap to pay, uh, mobile wallet infrastructure broadly across the country. Um, and almost two decades ago, uh, the Interact Network, um, propped up by our big five banks at the time, really meant that our, uh, we were well ahead of the US when it came to peer-to-peer -peer payments, for example. So when Cash App and Venmo are rolling out in the US, yes, those are super attractive um, to a young individual at university who feels like he's missing out. Uh, but at the same time, I, I can interact, email, transfer anyone in the country with facility. And there's broad adoption of, of interact in Canada, which meant that payments uh, as they rolled out in the US, um, were different in Canada and they were earlier, they were in many ways better, but it also meant that as time went on, um, we were being left behind because it wasn't um, 10 times better, right? Ca Cash App, Venmo weren't 10 times better. There wasn't the demand there. There wasn't the pressure on the banks to get that connectivity going. And Cash App and Venmo, I would, I would say, really drove um, connectivity in the US market. Now it wasn't payment connectivity, it was very much um, data and transferring money on old school, slow rails, but banks were very much pressured by consumers to ensure that they could connect their bank accounts and use Cash App and Venmo. And Canadians, I don't think really had that need and so weren't pressuring their banks. And so you can see how payments early on impacted the rollout um, of connectivity, open banking in the market and how they are being approached today. I don't think that uh, uh, modern payments, new payment rails are really a part of the conversation around open banking in the US and Canada, although they absolutely should be. In Canada, we have been very clear from the start uh, when policymakers and regulators were discussing open banking that we were gonna take a phased approach. Phase one is about data. Phase two is, is about payments initiation. And there isn't much um, 
in uh, the American debate around open banking on payments. And in fact, I would say the opposite is true, that the, the, the approach that's being taken right now in the US is almost concerning in that it limits the data that can be shared around payments. Um, you know, to get technical, uh, and I think this audience can be technical, we're talking about uh, not sharing routing data for bank accounts uh, in, in rule making in the United States. We're talking about sharing a tokenized version of that, which of course um, has um, good privacy and security implications to it, but also downsides. If you wanna create uh, a competitive alternatives for payments, you need to provide that source data. And so it's so interesting to see payments not driving open banking in both Canada and the US, but affecting it in different ways. Whereas in markets like Europe, the UK, India, payments very much is a driver of connectivity and open banking. It's um it's a bizarre one, isn't it? How far can you uh, innovate before you actually have to fundamentally change the rails? You know, it's uh it's like uh you know 1995 internet where we're getting uh, copper wires from a uh, you know it's do you know what I mean? It's like you can only do you can only increase the speed so much before fiber needs to be installed everywhere in order to really get the advancements that you need to. So um I mean, do you think a part of that, Andrew, is that each of these initiatives? Uh, you know, uh, regulators, government always have great intentions. It's like, actually, this thing's too big. We need to break it down into smaller pieces in order to allow people to to focus, you know. So, uh, you know, Fed now and everything that's happening from a payments perspective, are these just disconnected good ideas? Whereas actually, like you build any product, whether it's a fintech or anything, you know, your CPO needs to be the person who's pulling all of these good ideas into a great customer proposition. Um, you know, do you think there's almost a, a little bit of a disconnect there between, well, absolutely payments and open banking and open data and all of the, you know, all of the other things in this conversation need to be connected because ultimately it, we're talking about one consumer at the end of the day. They all need to be connected. And I can understand the drive to take a phased approach. It makes sense. The problem with the phased approach is, is ensuring that that second phase actually happens and that the, the phases that proceed it are, are supporting and enabling of those second and third phases. I think that is the biggest challenge and the concern that we have in both markets is our phased approach. And I'm gonna include screen scraping in that, in that initial phase from screen scraping to early API connectivity that's data focused. Will that then allow for payments to roll out in a modern way? Because the US has, has modern, modern payments now, the rollout and adoption is simply not there. Uh, in the Canadian market, we have delayed uh, new payment rails uh, several times now. It is um, growing a growing concern, I think, in the Canadian market in terms of our, our ability to be competitive with other jurisdictions. Um, when we have antiquated payment rails that we are um, very dependent on, but I, I do think that open banking can drive those use cases forward. And I, I'd like to think that our regulators are considering how to ensure that payments are a part of the process. They, they're looking to other markets, particularly Europe and the UK, where uh, I, I would say a different phased approach, but still phased, PSC one, two, three. You're, we're learning from the mistakes that have been made in other jurisdictions. Um, we're going to certainly make our own mistakes that I hope others can learn from. Um, but I'm fundamentally um, a believer that we're building towards something great uh, in, in both markets. We're taking a different approach uh, in, in each market, but there's real and positive work being done by both the market and, and government. Yeah. Do you know what the, the thing that was always, um, I think it's changed in uh, the last couple of years, if I'm honest with you, but the thing that was always the, the sort of guiding star uh, for the UK market particularly was was competition you know it was the it was the thing that changed the I mean they literally changed the name of the regulator because of it right so uh, but but creating competition in the market ultimately leads to better outcomes for customers in terms of everybody having to step their games up uh, and I, and I would say really I think the UK did start this inevitably like everything with the UK we start it and then we lose you know uh, momentum somewhere or other and somebody takes it on and does it better but but it's, it is amazing to see you know the the conversations that I'm having with 
uh, you know, regulators all over the world, everybody is still looking to the UK model as a, to your point, Andrew, like, how do we learn what didn't work and why it didn't work? And how do we take on the things that actually are going to be a little bit different in our geography because of the technology or customer needs or whatever? Um, but, but I guess, do you still see people using the, you know, the FCAs, the open banking playbook as a, this is how we should start this going? Yes and no. And, and part of uh, of learning from other jurisdictions and making our own mistakes in the United States and Canada, I think we are looking to what's been done in the UK and Europe and following their lead. Um, but, you know, you mentioned competition, so I'll, I'll start there. It's, I think it, it's it's valid to see open banking as a way to foster competition and to create a more dynamic financial service market in North America. But the way you create competition isn't by being too prescriptive. And I think that um, uh, early efforts on open banking uh, overseas were too prescriptive. Uh, for example, competition um, driven by account switching open banking, making account switching easier and uh, more readily available or apparent to consumers sounds like a great thing, but it creates an immense amount of cost and burden on banks and doesn't always have a lot of uptake. And that's always been a criticism of, of the prescriptive nature of open banking in Europe. I think you can create competition by simply opening up uh, access to consumer data and giving consumers better insights and better opportunities to switch if they want. But that doesn't necessarily mean having to uh, have one bank or another um, move data and bill payments and, and payroll data between each other. You can create competition simply by creating um, other players in the market who can do those sorts of things, who can take on um, that, that role of second or third account in your financial life and let, be less prescriptive about how you roll out connectivity. Um, that's actually what fosters innovation and innovation is actually what's gonna create competition. You cannot mandate competition, you cannot mandate innovation, but you can enable or foster the con conditions that allow for innovation. I think that's a really valid point. Yeah, the, you cannot mandate innovation. Like that should be the opening speech to any bank anywhere. Because uh, like you say, uh, I mean, you could have all of the right variables and still fail, right? You know, the, because that, that happens, you know, it might be the wrong time. It might be the wrong market. A global pandemic might come along. They're like all sorts of stuff, right? So, um, but that's a, a su such an interesting point. I mean, the point you when you sort of stand back from it, the point you're making is like, I mean, open banking isn't an island in this sense, right? It's not something that will succeed on its own. Your points around payments, your points around uh, opening up the market more broadly to allow new players to come in in terms of the regulatory approach to doing it. Uh, I mean, Kian as well, I mean, your organization doesn't sit in isolation of the entirety of the rest of the world, right? You've got customers who are your customers who standards are being set by completely other industries who are not inhibited by a lot of these things that financial services is inhibited by. So, I mean, is is this a, is open banking part of a, you know, it could be the king or the queen in a chess game, but it still needs all of the other pieces on the board, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think, Andrew, you, you had great, great points around open banking standards perhaps in some ways being too prescriptive. Uh, I think certainly for South Africa, like tons of tons of what stitch based our open banking principles on tons of what uh, like South Africa's open banking standards, which are only coming out in 2025, were based on uh, UK standards and PSD2. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of it, it's so hard because you, you do actually want tons of pieces to be regulated and you do want tons of pieces to come, you know, directly from a centralized source. Like PSD3 kind of, you know, was announced whenever it was uh, at some point last year. And it was like big reading for us inside a stitch. And we we're all excited and we we're like, okay, cool. There's like strong consumer authentication. Okay, that's nice. And like variable recurring payments are going to be better and the user interface is going to be better. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And then we're like, there's going to be a system for chargebacks. Uh, like that was the thing that was super sexy for us, right? Like you want there to be some sort of centralized way to kind of do stuff like that, right? And like, you know, uh, not being too prescriptive was great because we could move really fast. Some of the banks could move really fast where they had the capability and we moved uh, like at an incredible rate and we got tons of adoption. But then what happens when there's something like fraud, uh, right? And then it's like, 
the sending bank, there's the receiving bank, there's Stitch, there's the merchant. And then you're all kind of like, ah, there's no standard here. So you have to pay, you have to pay, you have to pay, you have to pay. Right. As Stitch, we can't like sit in the middle and be like, no, no, no. If, if it got sent like, like this, bank one, you're responsible. Oh, if it got sent like this, bank two, you're liable. Oh no, merchant, you're liable. It just kind of doesn't work and people point fingers. Um, and so like, I think open banking is a massive piece. I think the like how much regulation is involved versus the banks versus um, kind of payments providers is hard. And then like, how does it fit into the broader payments ecosystem? I, I think is always going to be a big factor, right? I think cash will always be a thing in our markets. I think cards will always be a thing, um, right? And I, I, I don't think we are of a like religious view that open banking is going to come and, and just take 100% of the market. But we think it can take a huge amount of share um, and, and it will be a, a critical piece, but it has to kind of play in the broader ecosystem. I think what all markets are now doing, um, from those that are late to the game, to those that were very early, they're finding out how to find that right balance between what pieces of regulation need to be prescriptive, what piece of of regulation need to be more principles based. And then when they consider the infrastructure of open banking and payments, what aspects need to be centralized, what aspects need to be decentralized. And I don't mean decentralized in uh, the blockchain sense. I, I, could, I, I mean it in, in a more traditional sense. And I think in each jurisdiction, that balance is going to be different. But I think what we're seeing, um, particularly in the Canadian market, having learned from all the other jurisdictions is that we are I think getting that balance um, really right. We're, I think we've, we've now dialed it in. There, there's details still, still to be worked out in the Canadian market, but we've now learned a lot and we're finding that balance really well. And I, But you do see it coming out uh, in PSD3. Um, I hope that the, uh, the CFPB in the US can you know put forward a rule that strikes a better balance. They haven't found it yet, but we're all finding that balance. And I think the consumer will be better for it at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think uh, ultimately that's that's the main thing, isn't it? It's uh, is the consumer going to be better off by by all of this effort, by all of this change in the market? So maybe if we close out there, I mean, look, considering everything and considering the journey, considering you know all of the pieces that are moving around and the iterations that we've seen, you know, do you think open banking is working? Uh, Kian, starting with you. Uh, yes. Uh, that, that's a very, it depends answer, but I'll, I'll go, I'll go yes. Um, uh, and to caveat it, I'll use the broader term of whether it's like directly banks who are coming up with their own standards, whether it is government mandated or even pieces of like real time payments rails. I think we've just seen massive adoption. Uh, it's kind of opened up the market in a way that I would not have expected three or four years ago. Like strictly speaking, like governments mandating that banks have to do X, Y, Z, I'm not sure. Like uh, open banking in sort of the broader sense and and what that's meant in the various parts that we've touched on. Yes, I, I think uh, it's a fascinating industry. It's been growing really, really fast. I think and Andrew's point is right. It's still in its nascency. It's working out, you know, what involvement is needed from all of the players. And I think once that gets a bit more fleshed out, we'll see even further progress, um, but still very, very early, but but very promising and exciting, obviously. Andrew, same question. Open banking, is it working? No. No to, sub, to some segments uh, of the market. No to some use cases. Um, no to certain um, segments of consumers. It's, it's, it's failing them and, and could be doing a lot more. Um, but to others, it, you know, it is, open banking is working today. Um, in Canada, where there is no regulation in effect, in markets where there is strong regulation, it is working. And so it makes me neither optimistic nor pessimistic about open banking. Um, it's just, there's more work to be done and we got to keep doing it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think uh, open banking is like evolution. Like, uh, you know, from our point of view, you can't tell whether it's working or not working, can you, at that point? But I think the direction of travel generally is that actually it's there for the benefit of consumers, like you say, Andrew. We we joke at 11FS that digital banking is only 1% finished. I think open banking is probably even less than 1%. And not because of it being done badly, just because of the huge amount of opportunity that's ahead of us to to really make a difference in the industry. And that's that's super exciting and probably like a very aspirational way of leaving the podcast, isn't it? So let's wrap it up uh, at that point uh, in the discussion. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Uh, where can people learn a little bit more about you and the great work that you do? Kian, starting with you. 
Uh, sure. We are very active on LinkedIn. You can find us at Stitch. It's the page with all the purple or on X at Stitch Money HQ. Very good. Andrew, where can people learn a little bit more? I share my thoughts on open banking on both LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can find me at andrewe.ca. Very good. As for me, uh, I'm you know, predominantly lurking on LinkedIn these days, so you can find me over there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you like what you've heard, follow the podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us make it better and helps other people find the show as well. As always, if you want to join the conversation, you can find us on all forms of social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider or email us on podcasts at 11FS.com. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>